Hello and thank you for being a part of it. My name is Spomele Lezondi. Now, in the last Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg telling America during internet freedom, despite connectivity the World Wide Web is 25 years old now. It is launching an inquiry, which we'll tell you about in a bit. Tonight, cinema and the developer of the How Rider app discussions. We are on SABC Network on Facebook. News Network at SABC. An email. Let's start with your social media and technology news. Canon Communications Authority of South Africa says it's launching an inquiry in the state of competition in the information and communications technology sector. This will also put broadband under the microscope. Communication Authority of South Africa says it will engage the Commission on certain aspects that fall within its mandate. ICASA inquiry seeks to level the playing field across the information and communication technology. It will focus on every sector, including mobile data, pay TV, and postal services. Councillor William Carey says the regulator wants to promote business in the industry. The logic is that you increase competition, you introduce into the market, and thereby uh, cost of communications. He also say lack of broadband download speed hinders the full effect of certain services, such as WhatsApp on your phone and Netflix on your home PC and other personal devices. In 2008, 700 network and service licenses were issued. Of these, only 416 are operational. This is partly why ICASA is launching this inquiry. The pay TV market will be checked too. This is dominated by multi-choice. ICASA issued four new licenses six years ago. Only Top TV managed to launch services, but they struggled to take off properly. ICASA has asked for written submissions from industry. It says the probe could take six to eight months. Portland Communications has released its findings of the research into the most active African cities on Twitter. The study focuses on the last three months of 2013. This was an era when the continent lost one of its greatest sons, former President Nelson Mandela. Here's Network Stile Kaswane with the details. The last quarter of 2013 was characterized by the passing of a global icon and Orlando Pirates' quest to conquer Africa. This significantly influenced the list of Africa's top tweeting cities. Ghana's capital city, Accra, topped the list of tweeting cities in West Africa. Surprisingly, Ghanaians tweet more often than the regional giant Nigeria. Moving east, Nairobi cemented its dominance over other more populous capitals in the region, such as Dar es Salaam and Addis Ababa. Kenyans are known for embracing technology. In the north of the continent, political turmoil in Egypt resulted in two of its cities making the top five of Africa's top tweeters. Alexandria was the fifth most tweeting African city, while Cairo was the third best. From there on, South Africa takes over, boasting three cities in the top five. Durban came out as the most tweeting coastal city in the country, urging out Cape Town. Gauteng dominates the table. Ekuruleni registered the second most geolocated tweets on the continent. Johannesburg, on the other hand, came out as the most tweeting African city, with traffic mostly driven by the passing of former President Nelson Mandela. Home to Orlando Pirates Football Club, Johannesburg was also monitoring the team's progress in the CAF Champions League. So keep tweeting. Now the past week marked a great milestone for the World Wide Web. It turned 25 years old. One of Africa's most talked about mobile service, M-Pesa, also celebrated its birthday. Kenya's M-Pesa has turned seven years old. The successful mobile money transfer service saw a rapid uptake of over 2 million users in its first year alone. On its seventh anniversary, M-Pesa now boasts over 17 million users and has cemented itself as the most convenient mobile phone-based financial service in Africa. M-Pesa allows users with an ID card or passport to deposit, withdraw and transfer money easily with a mobile device. 
Another one of the much talked about anniversaries of the last week was that of the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is how people share information on the internet and was invented by this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, a British computer scientist. Well, it was in 1989 and the internet already existed and that you could send email, but there was no websites, so there was no HTTP, there was no HTML, there was no space or things you could click through. And it began because I was frustrated it didn't exist. The existing systems that you had to log on to, to uh, they were all different, they were hard. Uh, I, <coughs> I imagined a system where you could just click from one to the other. And that was so compelling that I decided that I wanted to uh, build it. 25 years on, billions of people around the world share information, photos and status updates using the web. However, according to the World Wide Web Consortium, only about two out of five people in the world are now connected to the web. In Ghana, mobile phone network operators are asked to conduct SIM card registrations again. The government suspects fraud to have taken place during the process. Ghana's communications minister, Edward Bowama, says there are people who registered SIM cards with fake identity documents. He says a re-registration process is important to improve security in the country. Mark Zuckerberg went on his Facebook wall to vent about America's notorious internet surveillance. He even went as far as mentioning a call he'd made to President Barack Obama. Producer Lebusi Jage tells us more about this. Looks like America's National Security Agency has managed to get under Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg's skin. The co-founder of the social network went on his personal Facebook page to vent about their spying. As the world becomes more complex and governments everywhere struggle, Trust in the internet is more important today than ever. The social media guru praised the internet and deemed the World Wide Web as a platform that gives people a voice. The internet is our shared space. It helps us to connect. It spreads opportunity. It enables us to learn. It gives us a voice. It makes us stronger and safer together. Zuckerberg wrote that he was confused and frustrated by the repeated reports of the behavior of the U.S. government. He even went as far as mentioning a call he had made to the American president. I have called President Obama to express my frustration over the damage the government is creating for all of our future. Unfortunately, it seems like it will take a very long time for truthful reform. In the past, Facebook and Google have mentioned that they've received requests for users' profiles from many governments. They've also admitted to giving up data of many users, mostly those wanted by the American government. The world's largest high-tech trade fair has concluded in Germany. Here are some of the highlights from this year's CBIT. Humanoid robots, artificial intelligence and safety authorization devices are among the highlights of this year's CBIT. Roboy, for example, is a humanoid robot who might one day help doctors and scientists to better understand how brain and body interact. The robot is set to change the face of medicine and is supposed to become a platform for doctors to train. Not only did we imitate shape and look of a human, but also the functionality. We especially try to build muscles into joints instead of motors. We want to understand how it works. Another crowd puller was this robot called Charlie. It is the first robot with sensitive fit and a flexible spine. The intention here is to create a new kind of robot that is much more flexible in rough terrain. Our focus is on the spine. The spine is flexible and can move in all directions and has the same movement range as us humans. Following the Edward Snowden snooping revelations, there is a growing interest in a range of mobile devices that guarantee privacy. CBIT saw a number of mobile security management products. The industry is estimated at about 5 billion rands and the number is expected to nearly double in size by the year 2015. Sibit ended on Friday and pulled in over 200,000 visitors. The Bitcoin currency has been hit hard this past week. This follows reports that the world's largest Bitcoin exchange platform, Mt. Gox, filed for bankruptcy. Despite this, the cryptocurrency continues to grow. A new Bitcoin ATM has been installed in a city I really love, Hong Kong. 
bits and crumbs with the world's former largest Tokyo-based Bitcoin exchange, Mt. Gox, the digital currency seems to be gaining solid ground in China's financial market. This is proven true by a newly installed Bitcoin automated teller machine in one of the country's biggest cities, Hong Kong. The main thing is, is accessibility. Uh, I mean, this is just one more uh, uh, location or avenue for people to buy and sell Bitcoins. So I think this will help with the adoption because people are, you know, uh, creatures of convenience. Installed by Hong Kong's Bitcoin exchange platform, ANXBTC, the ATM is not used for withdrawal purposes. It instead allows people to exchange Hong Kong dollars for the virtual currency. ANXBTC says its main goal was to make Bitcoin transactions easier for the people. And they were determined to achieve this despite bankruptcy troubles at Mount Gox. There is a trust issue. I mean, I mean like I said, I, I, don't, I can't comment too much on Gox on what, what went wrong or why, why the issues they, or they faced. Through all the humps and bumps of the industry, Bitcoins are reported to have had about a 70 billion rand value increase in 2013. This is not bad considering some of the latest negative publicity. It's is ABC Network on Facebook and Twitter and we come back with a conversation about uh, the How Rider app. After the break, stay with us. Capitec Bank is asking why to simplify banking. Do you know what your bank costs are? I don't know, but I know it's too much. About 65 rand? Between 200 and 250. I don't, but I know it's too much. It's too much, yeah. Why don't you switch banks? Switch! Yo, way too much of a hassle, my man. We help 100,000 people open accounts at Capitec Bank every month. If you haven't joined us yet, ask why. Ask why. Remember, it's SABC Network on Facebook and Twitter, News Network at sabc.co.za on email. Now, in a bit, we'll talk about the How Trains How Rider app with its developer, Lita Soyizwapi. But first, let's take a look at some of the apps and sites developed here in Africa and for Africans. Access to medication is a problem for many in Africa. Sometimes fraudsters offer fake medication under the guise that it's life-saving, needed by people. As a result of this, a Ghana-based NGO, M Pedigree, has developed a mobile phone-based application that can verify the authenticity of medication. M Pedigree is an application, actually. It's actually a brainchild by a Ghanaian entrepreneur. He's a tech innovator. Mm. His name is Brian S Bright Simmons. So what M Pedigree does, it, is, it allows everybody with a mobile phone, uh, be it a feature phone or a smartphone, to validate medication that they've bought to, to ascertain whether that medication is valid or counterfeit. In Kenya, the popular M-Pesa application has gone into the public transport industry. It's a mobile phone payment app. Now no one will be allowed to use cash to pay when catching a ride in the country's popular Matatu vehicle. M-Pesa will be the only accepted method of payment. The Matatu um, conductor will have a, a, a unit himself a, and we call it a till, but it's actually just another phone. And you'll just do a normal, you know, Lipa 9 pesa um, transaction. Nigeria's Nollywood makes more films than America's Hollywood and India's Bollywood. Iroko TV has developed a streaming site to make it easier for people to access films from Nigeria. To our site, we get almost um, across platforms 5.7 million visit visits every month. So that is a massive audience, a premium audience of African eyeballs that you can monetize through advertising. And in South Africa, How Rider is a new How Train app, which we mentioned briefly last week. It helps commuters of the fast rapid rail and bus service know when it will reach their stations. The train moves between the, the richest city in Africa, Johannesburg, and South Africa's capital, Pretoria. Joining us in the studio to talk about How Rider is Lita Soyizwapi. He's the developer. Hello, and thank you for being a part of our network. Yeah, good evening. Mm. Now, what made you decide to come up with the How Rider app? 
Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an everyday user of the Caltrain, um, and I decided just to design something for myself first, something that I would be delighted to use every day, uh, something that would work without the actual network, um, because most uh, applications need the network to work. Um, so that was the reason. What information does it help the user with? It gives you real-time information in terms of when the train is going to depart um, uh, from any destination. Um, and it's in real time because it tells you the real, uh, the actual time, the next train time, and the next bus time. It's iOS 7? It's iOS 7, yeah. It's built for Apple uh, devices currently. What made you decide to go with that? I saw a lot of people with the devices, um, and I own Apple devices myself. And I thought that I wanted, since I wanted to build it for myself, um, and I seeing that even if people have got Android phones or other, uh, other platforms uh, in terms of the phones, they still have iPads. And there was no iPad-ready app. Okay. So I decided to build that. Now, was it difficult to come up with this and also to um, approach Apple with the idea? It was quite difficult. Um, I had to, to teach myself in terms of how the com computer programming works. I uh, downloaded a couple of uh, uh, tutorials from MIT, first basic computer science, um, and then I, uh, I, I downloaded some Stanford University uh, tutorials with Apple lecturers, guys who were actually working at Apple were lecturers. And approaching them with the idea and uh, to, to put them on their store? Actually, they were quite excited in terms of the user interface because it was quite refreshing. And I think they sent me some um, emails telling me that it's, it's, it's quite unique. Um, so in terms of the help as well, just to, to make it work better, um, I think I had great assistance, uh, assistance uh, with, with the team at Cupertino. Now, in Africa, we still have connectivity problems. Yes. Did you think about this when you're developing this app? Actually, that was the main reason I, I developed the app because most apps, people, they, they just copy what's happening overseas and then they come and implement it here. Uh, in South Africa, we, uh, data is still uh, very, very expensive. Um, my app doesn't use data. Um, it's got the intelligence of a smart uh, date feature whereby you don't need to choose the current date in terms of the, 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 the time. Um, because how train has got different times um, based on dates uh, and, 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 and ba based on weekdays. So mine automatically changes, and if it's a public holiday, it changes automatically. You're saying people cut and paste what's happening overseas. Yeah. What was different with yours? Mine, I had to rethink the navigational system. Because um, most people, they just push data, and then there are these things called table views that you scroll up and down, whereby you push data. Mine is a drag and drop um, uh, feature. It's got a drag and drop feature, whereby you just drag and drop and then you get um, the, the details. Mm. All right, Lita Soyuzwapi, developer of the Car Rider app. Thank you very much for being a part of our network tonight. Thank you very much. All right. Now remember to send us videos that tell us about your favorite app. You can upload them on YouTube and then tag us on Twitter. You can also send them via Dropbox and alert us on a news network at sabc.co.za. This week's video comes from Lutolo Mlozini from Midrand. Hi guys, my name is Lutolo. And today I'm going to tell you about my favorite app on my phone. The app is called Shazam. Shazam is a mobile phones based music identification application. What it basically does is it listens to the music that is being played and gathers the information with relevant links to services such as YouTube, Zune and iTunes. For example, you in a taxi or you're walking in the streets or you just walked in the dining room and that song that you really like but you don't know the title of is playing. With Shazam, you can listen to the song music. It's built in speaker and gather the information and it will give you the title and the artist and the year this, the, the, the track was made. world provides trusted world continent and local stories we deliver breaking news from across the globe and information on the latest top stories on business technology politics and sport 
analysis of the big global business and economic issues as they affect consumers and investors. Make sure you don't miss Your World, weekdays between 11 and 12 midnight. We keep the nation fully informed. Good evening and welcome to Afro Showbiz News. My name is Musam Kalipi and we have a lineup of stories of art and entertainment. I want my artwork to be in everybody's home. And if I want it to be in everybody's home, then it has to be affordable. The first ever produced vendor film, El Elwami, is to be released at cinemas in Johannesburg, South Africa. What does it take to really be Mr. Ugly? Zimbabwean William Masimu has got what it takes to be one. For him, it has yet another victory as he retains his title. That's Afro Showbiz News, Saturdays, 7.30 p.m. on SABC News. There is a cinema that can be folded up and packed in a box. It's called the Sunshine Cinema. It's mobile and visits rural areas in different parts of Africa. Joining us from Cape Town to talk about it is Misha Tiefdale from Queen Pub. Hello and thank you for being a part of our network, Misha. Hi there, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Mm. Now, what is Sunshine Cinema? Um, Sunshine Cinema is pretty much based on the idea of taking... Um, an indigenous idea or concept and being able to provide it to other people that would like to learn lessons um, from an idea that exists. Um, and the premise really ba is based on using um, appropriate technologies, so technologies that are available through um, simple systems and simple resources. And what we do is we, we film this, uh, this concept and it can be quite simple. Um, I'll give you a, a basic idea. So there's something called a liter light. And how the liter light works is you take a two liter bottle, you put some turps into it, and you mount it into the, the roof of an informal house. And what often happens is in informal settlements, there are limited windows because of um, security reasons or whatever the case is. And these liter lights then cast a lot of light during the daylight hours. Um, and what you're doing is you're essentially alleviating the need for the 12 hours of paraffin lights, which uh, obviously can cause respiratory issues and fire hazards. And so essentially what you're doing is you're applying an appropriate technology because it's a resource that it's available um, and it's creating a solution to a potential problem. Um, and so mm. what we've done is we've kind of packaged it in a way that allows for us to take the idea and um, find out about new appropriate technologies, things that indigenous communities, um, people on the ground now, in rural uh, circumstance, um, where they have their own concepts, and we can take these ideas and show them to other people that have similar issues that they are dealing with. Now, Misha, where did that idea come from? Um, the idea, I suppose, was twofold. I, I studied industrial design and I have a passion for sustainable design. And I'd done quite a lot of research into appropriate technologies. And I'd actually driven from Cape Town to London when I was 25. And during my trip, I'd seen a lot of villagers who were... I suppose they had certain solutions that they were doing and I'd go to the village next door and, there, and that solution wasn't being implemented and that could be from filtering water to mechanisms that ensured people were washing their hands and having that san sanitation levels. Um, and so for me the interesting dynamic was the lack of the ability to, sh to share information and I think in this modern world that we're living in, it's so easy when you have the use of the internet and you have access to information to be able to share information very quickly. But when you're inhibited by the lack of technology, um, yeah, it can be very difficult. Um, and then on the other side, uh, one of our um, co-founders, Sadell, she's um, very engaged with the social anthropolo anthropological side of things. And so the dynamic of having, instead of myself going into a community and saying, here is a solution, 
it wouldn't be me transferring that information. It would be someone who had maybe a similar mindset, someone who would be able to communicate in a similar language. Yes. And so the, the cultural barriers would be a lot closer yeah. um, as opposed to... Yeah, the scenario if, if I try and go and teach those lessons. Yeah, and now, Misha, I wish we had a lot of time to talk about this, but unfortunately we don't. Um, Misha no Teefdale there from Sunshine Cinema, thank you very much for joining us on Network tonight. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Now let's take a look at some of what's been happening in social media. Many took to social media to bid South Africa's Deputy President, Khalima Motlante, and Government Minister Trevor Manuel farewell. The two are retiring this year. They won't be back after the elections on May 7. In South Africa, Orlando Pirate fans are took to social media to vent about their team losing 1-0 to arch-rivals Kaiser Chiefs. They're unhappy with Pirates losing a number of matches recently. Chiefs fans used the same platform to share jokes about Orlando Pirates' recent bad performance. Oscar Pistorius' lawyer Barry Rue has become some kind of Twitter celebrity. Many in the country are having fun creating situations and how Rue would defend them. They're also using the line, what if I put it to you, to tell a few jokes. Rue has used the line many times in court. And that's all we have for you tonight. To find us on SABC Network on Facebook and Twitter, News Network at sabc.co.za on email. The video we leave you with is of a man who visited many parts of the world just to dance with the locals. Find it under Where the Hell is Matt 2013 on YouTube. From me and the rest of the team, have a good one. Mm -hmm.